My legal system is loosely based, but still very different from the one practiced by people with a law degree. These legal beagles leave snide comments, but if I can incur the wrath of a lawyer, that's already a good thing, right? They'll just bill the time spent being annoyed to every case they're currently working on, having to carve out those billable hours by hook or by crook. Elton John, Bernie Toppin Burn the mission down if we want to stay alive. Watch the black smoke rise to the sky. Watch the red flames light up the sky. Carrie and Danette were a typical young suburban couple. They met in college, partied hard until they decided they were meant to be together, and then they started to settle down. Both got degrees and found good jobs in the same city. A few years after the wedding bells rang, they had their only child, Chelsea. That was about nine months ago. Chelsea has Danette's nose and Carrie's chin. Luckily, her arms and legs are similar to her mother's, as Carrie has a rough build. No woman should have man hands like the Statue of Liberty, gasps. Wait, Ms. Liberty is a crossdresser? Damn those Frenchmen. As a reporter for Channel 8, Danette was ripe to interview Byron Wessler about the upcoming election. He was charming and exuded confidence. She resisted temptation at first, but he proved to be an experienced predator. When she began writing articles on topics that even the most experienced reporters couldn't get, rumors began to circulate about how Danette managed to interview people close to Byron. The rumors circulated suggested that spreading information was involved. Reporters can be so mean, not to mention they're also jealous. Let's face it, competing organizations enjoy spreading dirty laundry. Never let the truth ruin a good story. Danetta's time on the air once or twice a week easily doubled as she became a fan favorite during and after her successful pregnancy. In a well-rehearsed tactical strike, moments after one of the motel rooms slammed shut, a man in black rushed to the sedan and picked the lock in less than 10 seconds. Another man in a flowing black trench coat rushed to the car and did something in the back seat for about 30 seconds. The car doors closed and locked with a clicking sound, and the pair disappeared behind the building. A minute later, an exasperated woman burst through the front door and rushed to the registration desk. In a loud, panicked voice, she reported, there's an infant locked in your car in your parking lot. It was about 90 degrees outside and expected to be even hotter. The receptionist immediately called the police. The woman who reported the situation was kept waiting. No sooner had the smoke from the towing police tires cleared than a Channel 6 news van arrived on the scene. Music from the TV series NCIS played as the parking lot began to resemble a movie set. How the Channel 6 team knew it was there would be long in the making. Armed with improvised tools, the officers easily picked the sedan's lock and freed the sleeping child from the death chamber. The other officers began banging on doors to find Carrie or Donetta Hargrove. Those names were listed on the car's registration card in the glove compartment. It didn't take long. Mrs. Danette Hargrove, covered with a blanket, was let out of the room. The camera crew was more interested in the gentleman hiding behind the door. It was rumored to be State Senator Byron Wessler. It was none other than the porter who spread these rumors. Mr. Wessler was the man who paid for the room, so the porter was quite confident in his claims. The overheard conversation between Danette and the police officers took place shortly after Danette was read her Miranda rights. You are under arrest for child abuse, criminal neglect, and reckless endangerment of a minor. Other charges may be filed if it appears that the child suffered collateral or permanent damage from your attempt to kill her. No, I did not leave her in the car. You don't understand. I dropped Chelsea off at my mother-in-law's house no more than an hour ago. Call her. I don't know how Chelsea ended up in the backseat of my car. I'm sorry, Mrs. Hargrove, but we have to get Child Protective Services involved. You are facing serious jail time for putting your daughter's life in danger. But I didn't do that. I would never do that. Just like you would never break your wedding vows. Am I right? His snide comment was like a punch to the gut. It finally came to her that everyone was going to find out she was a fraud. Her fate was sealed when a reporter from Channel 6, whom she had met several times before, called out to her. 
Hey, Danetta, any comments? Like a frat party scene, the blanket covered Danetta was handcuffed and placed in the back seat of the patrol car. She begged the officer to call her mother-in-law and gave him her number. A minute later, the officer called back, I'm sorry, Mrs. Hargrove, but your mother-in-law said she turned you down this morning because she had business to attend to and couldn't watch Chelsea. Realizing she had been set up, Danette sat back and pondered. Her life was unfolding before her eyes. She felt an ache in her chest at the realization that Carrie knew about her affair. He should have realized it was just work-related. She shuddered as she realized Carrie wasn't going to be very lenient. Did you check the security cameras? Asked Danetta. Yes, ma'am. They weren't working today, replied the stoic officer. Danetta was annoyed that he addressed her as ma'am. In her 28 years, she was too young to be addressed that way. You see, they did it on purpose. I didn't leave the baby in the car. Someone put her in there. So you say. You'll have a chance to call someone who cares after you're admitted. Good luck figuring out what you're going to put on it. Then why are we still sitting here? I wanted you to see Child Protective Services take your child away from you, hopefully permanently, he said with a note of snide righteousness in his voice. Despite Danetta's attempt to arrest them, tears came to her eyes. Surely they wouldn't take her daughter away from her, would they? Hey, Carrie, you're being paged online too. This is Carrie. Mr. Hargrove, this is Wanda Richards from Child Protective Services. We have your daughter Chelsea with us. Excuse me, Child Protective Services? I'm confused. How did you end up at my daughter's house? Was she hurt? Well, sir your wife left Chelsea in the car while she was having fun with a man in a motel room. The police were called and they in turn called us to rescue the child. As far as we can tell, you have no outstanding court cases, so you can come and get your daughter. We have obtained a restraining order prohibiting your wife from coming within 500 feet of your daughter. Wow, that's a lot to digest. Of course I'm coming to pick up Chelsea. Where are you located? There was an exchange of information. Carrie was in a daze. As a programmer, he could get a little vacation time by complying with a simple request. The elevator reached the first floor before Carrie realized he hadn't asked for time off. Shaking off the daze, he took the elevator to his floor. Hey, Carrie, you look like your dog died, one of his cubicle neighbors said. It couldn't be worse. I need to meet Glenn. A moment later, Glenn, I have a serious family emergency. I need to pick up my daughter from Child Protective Services. Glenn looked him in the eye. That's new. Is everything okay with you? You look upset. They said Danette was in a motel room and left my daughter in the car. In this heat? That's crazy. Go. Call me if you need a day off tomorrow. Like a man on his way to execution, Carrie headed for his car. An hour later, Chelsea and he were reunited. The ride home had failed to untie the knot in his stomach. Danette at the motel? Was she doing an interview? Was that unthinkable? The lady said, entertaining a man. Chelsea needed a change of clothes and a warm bottle. After feeding her, he played with her until she started to get cranky. Rocking back in his chair, resting Chelsea's head on his chest, he continued to ponder. He carefully placed the sleeping baby in the crib. Turning on the television, he watched the news. They were talking about the reporter who had left the baby in the car while she met with State Senator Byron Wessler. Carrie felt like punching something, but how could she? He was on the warpath and was already filling out online forms in an hour, preparing to meet with the family lawyer. They hadn't had time to amass a fortune, but Carrie had followed all the steps outlined on the divorce website. Carrie, I've been arrested. My parents are still on the cruise, so I need you to bail me out. This is a complete misunderstanding. Also, can you please find a lawyer to represent me? Danetta slumped down in her chair. Her one and only call had gone to message. Where was he? 
Had he ignored her call on purpose? Back in her cell, she waited patiently. The patience had helped for the first two days, but now it had run out. The bottled water was turning into tears faster and faster. She perked up when a sheriff's deputy called. There's someone here to see you. You know the drill. Same as the phone call. Shackles on. Danette thought the man standing there was the lawyer Carrie had arranged to meet with. But that wasn't what it turned out to be. Danette Hargrove, you have been served with a subpoena. Served? What the hell does that mean? Have a nice day. Go back and answer my question. What does serve mean? The deputy roughly took Danetta back to her cell. It wasn't until the handcuffs were removed that her world took on an even more disgusting smell of shit. It was divorce papers, and Carrie was demanding full custody of Chelsea, citing that Danette was an unfit mother. There was also a copy of a restraining order preventing her from going near Chelsea. The sparse combination of four-letter words sounded for a few minutes, and then there was a woman's wail full of despair. When Danetta appeared before a panel of judges, she explained to the judge that her husband had not returned her call and therefore she had no legal representation. The judge allowed her to call her grandparents. A few hours later, a young attorney in an orange jumpsuit sat across from her. The makeup applied a few days ago was gone from his face, along with the swagger of a successful reporter with a promising career. They spent over an hour together while Danetta blamed everyone who had anything to do with her husband's family. Going through their options, they demanded a jury trial after pleading guilty. Since Danette was found not guilty, her attorney was able to get her released on her own recognizance. In this case, the judge simply releases you on a promise to appear at your next court date, based on the fact that you have established ties to the community and are not a danger to yourself or others. Getting her cell phone, Danette called Carrie, and he quickly answered. Hey, how's it going, investigative reporter? Finding yourself looking for news? What do you need? Is Chelsea safe? Like you care? Yes, I have her in an undisclosed location. You can go back to the house as long as I can't interfere with that. If you even try to track me down, I'll levy a restraining order against you and you'll rot in jail. Is there anything you don't understand? How could you do that to her? She could have died. I'm sorry, you're the one who left her in the car while you and your boyfriend had sex. You know damn well I didn't leave Chelsea there. You think you're so smart, but I'm going to nail you and your mother's ass, and then neither of you will ever see Chelsea again. Chelsea won't even remember you in a year. We won't give her any reason to doubt that you died giving birth to her. Carrie, you can't do that. She needs her mother. She needs me. Guess you've forgotten about that now, huh? Keep in touch. No way. Carrie, don't you dare hang up on me. Carrie, damn you, came the end of call tone. Fearing losing her daughter forever and possibly getting up to six years in prison, Danette decided to get to the bottom of it. Sitting in her attorney's office, she asked, did you record the phone conversation? Yes, sir it's just like you told me. He didn't even hint that he was involved. I'm afraid. They can't take Chelsea away from me, can they? Well, if what you say is true and they get away with it, you'll probably lose all parental rights. His mother set me up. Can't we get cell phone data or porch cameras to see who came and went from their house? I swear I dropped Chelsea off at their house and the clerk, someone paid him to turn off the security cameras. How can we prove that? That kind of thing costs money. From what you've indicated, including in your divorce petition, you can't afford it. I'm not giving up Chelsea without a fight. Were you able to get a message to my parents? They were on the ship sightseeing. I think we'll hear from them tonight. Let's consider another possibility. How do you think they found out you were meeting Byron? Where and when? I don't know. We've only been through here a few times, and the last one was almost a month ago. Can you tap phones? Byron called me and suggested a meeting place. 
I was at an outdoor cafe at the time and didn't repeat what he said. If you look at our financial statements in the divorce packet, Carrie didn't spend money on anything out of the ordinary. His mother was involved. They had to have had something to do with it. Three months earlier, they're having fun from a 55-year-old man. Charlie, don't be so rude. From Sylvia, his age. That's fine, they're fornicating, he continued, watching their sister-in-law, Danette, interview a political candidate on TV. How do you know that? From the way they look at each other, like they have a secret in common. What kind of secret could a reporter and an asshole like him possibly have? Tell me, honey. Well, they certainly exchange flirtatious glances, I guess. Maybe he told her a joke, a dirty joke, maybe, you know. I tell you, she has such a fresh and fulfilled look, like yours this morning when I watched you wiggle your bare ass into the bathroom. So you're passing judgment without knowing for sure? Yes, and I'm going to spend my granddaughter's inheritance to prove it. Take it out of my coffin. I hope you're wrong. I'd hate for something to happen that would limit my time with Chelsea. That's an excellent point. The courts will punish Carrie if he files for divorce, and we may never see Chelsea again, unless don't mess with old people. They may have taught you everything you know, but they haven't taught you everything they know. Ten days after the arrest, Danette was still working on paper. She was no longer in front of the camera, but was now completely hidden from view. Being interviewed through her charms was something the executives didn't seem to pay attention to. Besides, the viewers really wanted to see her on the air. Strange, living in a rented house without a husband or child was driving Danetta crazy. Her friends were doing their best to cheer her up. Her parents, back from their cruise, spent a lot of time with her. And Carrie, despite her, had his friends send Danetta pictures of Chelsea being held in the arms of unnamed women. Maternal instinct takes over when a young woman holds an infant in her arms. Danetta was furious that her daughter was socializing with these sluts. That was exactly the reaction Carrie had hoped for. These women were the other mothers at Chelsea's new daycare center, but Danette didn't know that. By this time, Carrie was already deflecting Danette's calls with the words, Chelsea is fine, thanks for calling. 33 days after her arrest, Danette was indicted. Her trial was set for 10 weeks later. Her attorney said that if she cooperated with the court-ordered competency hearing, there was little chance of a continuance. Danette wanted this nightmare to end. Her heart ached from being separated from Chelsea. On Saturday morning, answering the doorbell, Charlie found a man in casual clothes. Mr. Hargrove, I'm Detective Lou Hensley. I was wondering if you and your wife could spare me a few minutes. I have some outstanding questions regarding your grandson. Charlie turned and raised his voice. Hey, Sylvia, got time for a detective? Faintly. Sure, give me a few minutes to clean up. Get him a drink. Come on in, Mr. Hensley. Have a seat at the dining table. May I offer you something to drink? Not at all. Thank you. A minute passed before Sylvia appeared. She sat down next to George, then greeted their guest. Good afternoon, sir ma'am, you can stop the interview at any time. Can you describe the morning you gave up your sister-in-law? I was putting on my makeup, getting ready to meet my friend Tara at the store. The trinket shop is going out of business and there's as much as I enjoy watching my granddaughter, I've already likes the little cherubs and I like the snow globes. Lou interjected, Mrs. Hargrove, we were discussing Danetta and Chelsea. Oh yes, I'm sorry. I was gathering my purse and keys when Danette walked into the house. Chelsea was in her car seat. I kissed them both and then told Danette I had to run if I was going to meet Tara on time. Lou really disliked talking to the women at home. They were always ready to chatter until their eardrums swelled up. So Danette and Chelsea are out? Yeah, we headed for the door, but then I remembered I'd left my phone plugged in, so I waved goodbye to them and went to get my phone. When I came out again, Danette was gone. I went to the stores and met up with Tara. Do you want to see the snow globes I bought? No, that's okay. Mr. Hargrove, 
Where were you that day? Well, I work from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. every weekday, so I was at work. It seems to me that a good detective should have known that by now. Am I right? Yes, sir, you're right. And I did check it out before I came here today. So why did you waste our time asking about something if you already knew the answer? Just doing my job, sir when did you find out about your granddaughter? When Sylvia left a message on my phone. We can't have our own phones when we work with machinery, so mine was in my locker. When my shift was over, I saw the message. Sylvia answered right away and told me about what they were telling everyone on TV. So, Sylvia, when did you find out about your granddaughter? Tara and I were in the food court, and there are monitors scattered in the seating area. Tara said something like, isn't that your daughter-in-law? And I started watching the news. They don't have sound, but there's this thing where they type what they're saying. George says, with closed captioning? Sylvia continues, never mind. Anyway, I went to Channel 8's website, but it wasn't very helpful, so I went to Channel SAXS website. There I found out that my sister-in-law was doing dirty deeds with this nasty politician and that she left Chelsea in the car. What kind of mother does that? I paused briefly before asking, would you be willing to take a lie detector test? George immediately replied, well, my neighbor is a lawyer and she told me that those results are not admissible in court. It shows that you guys can trick people into giving wrong answers. She told us never to settle for something like that, and I think that's good advice. Lou felt their answers were well rehearsed, but he had nothing to dwell on. Thank you for your time. I think I'll be going now. George and Sylvia stood up at the same time and walked the detective to the door. With a wave of his hand, George ran his hand down Sylvia's back and then pinched her butt. Ouch, what's that for? I always do that before I rip your clothes off. You got it last night. And I'm getting it now, George muttered, chasing Sylvia into the bedroom. The wait for the trial was agonizing for Danette. She felt that the police were doing little to exonerate her. Pre-trial motions were filed and the judge ruled that the trial should proceed as scheduled. When her attorney talked about the plea bargain, Danette became physically ill. Six months in jail, 200 hours of community service, and a $1,000 fine. She was accepting a felony conviction. Just when Danette thought it couldn't get any worse, there was another incident involving a child left in a locked car. Channel 6 did an editorial demanding justice without naming anyone in particular. It's hard to find an impartial jury nowadays. Although Channel 8 viewers were still eager to see Danetta on camera, the network prepared for the worst. With the trial three weeks away, she was suspended with pay until the trial was over. Faced with the possibility of permanently losing her parental rights and receiving a much harsher prison sentence, Danette mentally prepared herself to accept a plea bargain. And then something strange happened. The prosecution dropped all charges against her without prejudice. While this meant the case could go back to trial, she was free to move on with her life. Danette's attorney explained that Channel 6 had been notified that the child was in danger even before the video surveillance in front of the motel captured her car entering the parking lot. Such reasonable doubt could not be ignored. Channel 6 went on and on about how some people used their position in society to get away with crimes without naming anyone in particular. Channel 8 brought her back to work but no longer filmed her until further notice. Some viewers hatefully dumped Danette, accusing her of avoiding prosecution because of her celebrity. Never let facts get in the way of your hate-based existence. As soon as the case was closed, the gloves were off, exposing vicious fangs. A few hours later, the protective orders were lifted. Danette filed a new motion with the court. She was granted primary custody, and Carrie was granted all other rights for the weekend. Carrie was ordered by the court to turn Chelsea over within 24 hours. The game was on. Carrie's attorney outlined a bleak future for him. Danette, who has no criminal record, will almost certainly get what she petitions for. Epilogue. Danette and Carrie divorced. Danette got primary custody. George and Sylvia can only see Chelsea when Carrie has them. 
Byron Wessler felt no repercussions from his liaisons with Danette. Politicians are immune to consensual sex scandals, albeit with married partners. Danette moved to Channel 2 and exposed some irregularities at Channel 6, resulting in the program director losing her job and the channel losing longtime advertisers. In the end, those who wanted to cash in on Danette's promiscuous behavior paid a heavy price. Karma doesn't like mere mortals getting involved. George and Sylvia were questioned separately several times, but no criminal charges were ever filed. Kerry has a strained relationship with his parents. He needs their help with Chelsea, but feels they should have stayed out of the story. Danette can be seen at high-profile events as eye candy for the rich and powerful. And Kerry is chomping at the bit to keep up with a court-ordered divorce of a man. Libra justice is rarely balanced.